random junk from the archives. It's Brian Blessed, thank you uh, no, for it's joining a pleasure. us. Well, I mean, I mean I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear. I think a light has gone out, you might say, in the universe. Uh, well, I mean, we're quite close, uh, Jerry, you know, um, a great sense of humour. Uh, uh, and I, I did Space 1999. I did one where I was a kind of master of a frozen planet and seduced uh, 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 Bane, Barbara Bane, <laughs> uh, uh, Martin Landor's wife in it. I mean, I'd seduced her as a character. And I persuaded her to leave the planet with me. Unfortunately, it was a bad idea. And I aged 2,000 years. I was just about to plant a kiss on her lips. <laughs> And she screamed her head off, so that was my big chance to be romantic, but I turned into a skeleton. And it was, um, it was a frozen planet, and it was directed by Charles Crichton, who did Lavender Hill Mob, all those films. And Charles said, oh, Brian, I want to do another. And I, then I played the, uh, the, the master of a, a volcano uh, planet uh, in which I was a mentor, and my daughter became a regular in the series Maya, uh, who could change shape, and she was my daughter. It's a bit like Prospero and Miranda, etc. And I did this marvellous script again, Charles Crichton. And then about, about a few years later, Jerry suddenly uh, said to me, Brian, I'm, I, my big ambition is to make a, a, a film where a man goes through a, a, a black hole. And it was written by scientists, and it was called The Day After Tomorrow, Into Infinity. And it had very good rockets in it, photon drive. And again, it was directed by Charles Crichton. And Diana at Durban was... Uh, uh, my wife in it, and I had my son in it because you had to take your family with you because uh, uh, going through a black hole meant you'd be a light years away uh, and the Earth probably wouldn't have existed after your journey. So it was written by scientists, and there was Jerry, and I remember he, the film wasn't going, and he would send me telegrams rather like his program. He, his, his diction was very much uh, uh, rather like... like uh, it's serious. Brian, it's a go. No, it's a not. It's not a go, Brian. Not yet. And then suddenly another take up. It's a go. It's officially a go, a go. We're going. We're going. And that's the kind of telegrams I had from him. And it, it was a, a terrific kind of film into infinity. Uh, and uh, uh, we did it at Pinewood with Charles, I said. And then many years later, I was at Bray's studio doing a documentary. It was a, a series called The Old Man of the Mountains. Uh, some Swedish stories, I think. And they said, oh, Jerry Anderson's here. And he was, of course, you know, it had all gone to pot. You know, he was kind of a marriage that hadn't worked out, and, and he was bankrupt and this, that, and the other. And he's in, a, he's in his little office down there. And I went down a corridor, and it was virtually cobwebbed, you know. And I got into this, and, the, and there he was sitting with his head bowed and bald. How are you, Jerry? He said, oh, I, I live in hope, Brian, I live in hope. It wasn't the kind of bold, mm -hmm. marvellous technical man anymore. And he had no money. And he and said, I just pray one day, you know, that Thunderbirds will come back and Captain Scarlet will come back. And, oh. of course, he did. And he became a millionaire again. And he became successful again. And I did a concert for him at, um, uh, on, on the South Bank at the Festival Theatre in, in his honour, the music and all the different... Uh, programs he made and Brian, uh, he, he, so he became a great success again Brian did, did he when you were working with him did you realize how uh, sort of revolutionary some of his plans and projects were were you sort of carried along by the force of what he was doing and proposing or did you have to be convinced no no he didn't have to be convinced uh, he was completely a man of kind of faith I mean uh, and, and I remember one lunchtime he was so confident that his friends were kind of influential and suddenly I had lunch with Gene Rodenbury and all those people, all the Star, Star Trek people. I think they were almost keen for me to be a regular in Star Trek. And, and I said to Gene Rodenbury, I don't think so. I, I want to do other things, you know, it, it takes too much. And I, including adventures, I want to go climbing mountains and things. So I, and I, I, I met Rodenbury and I, I kind of turned down really being in Star Trek. Uh, but I... Mm, but he, he knew all these people, and he, he, he believed his own publicity. I mean, he believed he had a tremendous kind of knowledge of science and so forth. But he also had a Peter Pan. So, you know, he, he subscribed very much to, to what Arthur Conan Doyle would say, you know, that the, the child is father of the man. He was very much... 
he wasn't childish, but childlike. Yes. And he had a tremendous love of the universe. Yes. And astronomy, and people like Patrick Moore, and, and, and scientists. And he met scientists all the time. He got their latest theories, theories he could expand on. And, and so he was kind of always galvanized and full of energy and alive. It's well, like a kind of torpedo to look at, I was thought. Know, just, just this bald head and, and kind of tall and, and, and looking at this infectious grin. And we just got on like a house on fire. Oh, terrific, terrific to hear your thoughts and your memories. Uh, Brian Blessed, we're very grateful to you uh, for joining us.